So the next topic we're going to be looking at is uh, something that is the driving force behind most games made. And that goes way back to the 70s and 80s, all the way up to today. And that driving force is something called a game loop. And it's no different than any other type of loop. It's just what's inside the loop that really makes the difference. So a game loop is essentially an infinite loop. Think of it like this. Think of like a, an infinite loop that starts at while true. So it's going to loop forever, no matter what. And inside that game loop, the first thing that really occurs is an if statement. And that if statement essentially says, if enough time has passed. We'll get into that in a second. If enough time has passed. Inside of here, we have a set of actions that need to occur. We do things like get the user input. Once you have the user input, you need to update the game. We'll go into what each of these mean in just one second. Update the game. Once you've updated the game, it's time to redraw. It's time to redraw the game. Redraw. And finally, play some sounds if needed. In reality, what's actually occurring here is we're simulating an old school animation system. An, anima an animation system works like this. Draw an image, slightly change that image, redraw it. That's really what we're doing because that's what a game does. It draws the screen, does some modifications on the logic end to make sure that the next time it draws, it looks slightly different. And when it is slightly different, it creates that illusion of animation or movement. So what we need to do is we need to do more than the illusion of movement and animation. We need the, we need the whole idea of the game logic is going to change everything. So it'll handle physics, it'll handle collisions, it'll handle scoring, it'll handle uh, restrictions, all these different things, and networking depending on the type of game you're building. The idea is that this game loop drives everything, and it goes forever. The only time it will ever stop is if somehow you have some logic, maybe in your update section, that will essentially tell it to get out, you're finished, break out of the loop. So what we want to do is we're just going to narrow this down. We're just going to clean this up just a little bit. So our game loop is, co is consistent, or sorry, consists of the following items. The first thing we have is our time check. Following our time check, assuming that we can, we do user input. Following the user input, we have our update. Following update, we have our draw, and then following that we have sounds. So just briefly, what we're going to do is we're going to quickly go into each of these just to kind of understand exactly what's happening. So the idea behind the timing check is that to create this illusion of motion, we need to redraw the screen a certain number of times per second. We call that a frame rate, the number of frames visible per second, so frames per second. You've probably heard the term FPS before, not first person shooter, but FPS in terms of frames per second. It essentially means how many times per second is the entire screen being refreshed. So this time check essentially says limit it to a certain number. So we could limit it to say do um, only do 15 updates per or only do 15 frames per second or do 60 frames per second, right? So depending on the device you're working with or the medium you're working with, that frame rate might change. So um, TV, I believe, works at around 24 frames per second, standard television, whereas most games run between 30 and 60 frames per second, and they create a much more smooth look as a result. So that's really what the time check is about. It's about limiting the computer to say, hey, if enough time hasn't passed yet to draw the next frame, check again later. So once we've passed the time check, we get into the next section, which is really the uh, user input section. Now this is where you're just going to get the user input. Now sometimes that may be the idea of prompting the user for something, but it may be uh, much more simple in terms of if they're using a controller. They might hit the jump button, for example. So if they click the jump button, then we might set up a boolean that tells the rest of the game, hey, the player is trying to jump. That boolean will then be used later on in the next step. So in the next step, we get into the input section. Or sorry, the update section, not the input, the update section. The update section is probably the most important section of all of the pieces of the game loop. The update essentially says, 
make everything work. Maintain everything that's currently doing its stuff. Start new things and end old things that don't need to be done anymore. So this will do things like, okay, the user just clicked the jump button. I have a Boolean called like is jumping that's set to true. So I better start the, the player on a vertical movement. So start increasing the Y value of the player. So it starts to go up. Or we start to apply a vertical velocity to it. That type of thing. Or it might be the idea of a collision occurred. So detect that collision. And then what has to happen as a result? Do things bounce? Do things explode? Do scores get added to? Do scores get removed from? It all depends on what the game is or what the product is that you're building. Maybe that collision is nothing more than checking to see whether the mouse pointer collided with a button so you know whether to change it to a hover animation or whether their user is currently clicking while they're hovering over that button so you know whether to do the action of that button. So all this stuff is done in the update along with things like physics and everything like that. All that stuff is handled there, and it essentially updates all of the data for the rest of the program. See, the thing is, is that a game is really set up like two pieces. We have our visual component, and then we have our data component. The data component is the important part. The data can exist without the visuals. The visuals cannot exist without the data. So the data drives everything, and this update drives the data. Once we've set up all of our data, it's then time to go down into the draw portion. Now the draw portion simply looks at the data and then puts whatever needs to be put on the screen using that data. So for example, if you're drawing the player who just recently started jumping, that player's position has now moved vertically. So now you have to draw the player in its new location. Things have changed. So we've created that system that allows to give us the illusion of animation. Now similar to uh, setting up like the is jumping boolean inside of the user input section, it also might have triggered a sound effect, which brings us to our next and last portion, which is the idea of playing sounds. We don't want to play sounds if we don't need to, right? We don't need to, we don't want to load them if we don't, if we don't need to, and we don't want to waste any resources. So we only actually play the sound when it's required. So in certain... Um, uh, IDEs or sorry in certain languages and whatnot you may be restricted to playing a certain number of sounds at a at a time or even certain types of sounds so you might be able to play a bunch of sound effects but only have only one background music playing at the same time so these types of things are restrictions that we have to deal with depending on um, the language that we're working with so that in essence is the game loop from top to bottom now we're going to use that game loop to start to create graphical applications and we're going to focus on the XNA development environment so we can um, really try and do these graphics a lot easier than most standard situations.